and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Thank you for listening to the Hearing by the Word of God broadcast. I'm TJ Bing, and I hope this message will be a blessing to you. Now let's open our Bibles and get right to the message. Thank you for tuning in to the Hearing by the Word of God broadcast. This is the um, the second week, second broadcast of the year, and I hope you enjoyed last week. I hope it was a blessing to you. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, once again, I want to say, you know, hopefully soon I'm planning on having some other people maybe get on here and, and join in. Um, as far as having some other preachers on here, giving some people some opportunity to preach on the radio. Got a couple guys I'm trying to get in on that. So hope you're looking forward to that. I know it's going to be a great blessing. And um, I also wanted to mention if anybody out there needs to uh, maybe get in touch with me, maybe you'd like, you know, me to come preach, or maybe you would, uh, you have a Bible question or a question about one of my uh, messages or something I said, you can, uh, you can actually email me, and my email address is tjb, tjb, all right, so it's TJB Radio Ministry at gmail.com, TJB Radio Ministry at gmail.com. If you have any Bible question, anything you want to ask me, maybe it's a question about one of my messages, maybe you want information on how to get saved, um, just shoot me an email, I'll try to get back to you. And uh, so, yeah, let's go ahead and let's get into the message for today. So I'm going to have kind of a, a long introduction here to my message before we get started. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about um, a little bit about God in relationship to man. We're going to talk about mankind. We're going to talk about Jesus as a man. Uh, in fact, if, if there was a title to this message, I might would call it... Uh, the, the man Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not necessarily completely about his humanity, but it's things about things about his humanity. The Bible is all about man's relationship to God. Okay, so you read the Bible, we we'll find out things about God. That that's the only way that we know who God is, how He's holy, how He's just, how He's the Creator, how He He loves us. The only reason we know any of these things about God is because we have the Bible. It's because we have the Word of God where He has told us who He is. He has told us, He's given us what we need to know to know about Him. Also, the Bible, we find a lot about ourselves. We find a lot about mankind, and it's in relation to God. You know, we see us ourselves in comparison to God. And you know that that's why it's so important to read the Bible because we as 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 humans as in in this flesh we tend to compare ourselves to each other. So when we see somebody that in our fleshly mind we think we are better than them, we feel good about ourselves because we're constantly comparing ourselves. But when we read the Bible, we're comparing ourselves to a holy God. The whole Bible is about God made man, wanted a relationship with man, fellowship with man, man messed it up by sinning, sin separates man from God, God wants to restore that fellowship, God wants to restore that relationship, and so the Bible is the story telling us how God is reconciling the two back together, how God is is fixing that relationship. So how does God plan to restore this fellowship? How does he plan to restore this relationship. Well, the sin that we have, the sin that separates us from God, it must be paid for. God is a holy God. He's a just God. And even though he loves us, even though he cares for us, even though he created us, he cannot let that sin go unpaid for. He cannot just, just let it sweep it under the rug. That sin must be paid for. Now, here's where the problem lies. Man cannot pay for the sin because they are sinners. God cannot pay for that sin because he is not the one that owes the debt. God is not man. God is not man. 
man is a sinner, and this sin must be paid for. So, how is the sin going to become, be paid for? And we also know from the Bible that blood must be shed, but not just any blood will do. Blood of a goat is not going to do it. Blood of a lamb is not going to do it. Blood of any kind of just animal is not going to be sufficient to take away the sin of mankind. There has to be someone who is holy, who is without sin, but yet is a man in order to take the payment for sin. If you have your Bibles, look at Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9, verse 27. If I say, I'll forget my complaint, I'll leave off my heaviness and comfort myself, myself. I am afraid of all my sorrows. I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent. If I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, Yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me. For he, speaking of God, is not a man, as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. We see the sorrow here. We see the anguish here of a man that is longing to, to have that relationship between him and God restored. A man that is longing to have somebody that can pay for the sin. A man that is longing to, to come to God, to be with God, to be able to just simply come before God and talk to him. And he says, there's nobody. God's not a man, and I'm so dirty. I'm so wicked and vile. I can't get to God. And we, we, we see the, the, the problem here. But the good news is, is that God had a plan. God had a plan and he made a promise. Back in Genesis 3.15, he said, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. We see the first, we see the first prophecy of the one that would come to restore mankind to its original position with God that would come to take away sin. We find out later in the Bible, the seed that he talks about in Genesis 3, we find out it's God. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. The old virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Matthew 1, 23 tells us Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So God told the people, God laid it out in his word, I'm going to send someone to save you, I'm going to send someone that is going to save you from your sins, and this is not just going to be anybody. This is not just going to be a, a, a good person, because a, a good person will not be sufficient. This is going to be me. This is going to be God himself, and yet a man. We find out that it's he's going to be a ruler in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So, this man, there's, there's way more prophesied about Jesus in the Old Testament. That is not uh, covering all of it. But I just want to sh wanted to, to bring that out, that the Lord made a promise. I'm going to send you someone. I'm going to send you a Savior. I'm going to send you the Messiah. And we see this man show up in the New Testament. And what I want to look at for a few minutes with the, major with the rest of our time is what the Bible says about this man. Multiple times in the New Testament, the Bible uses the phrase, this man, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at a few of those. My first point is this man is speaking. John chapter 7. If you've got your Bibles, John chapter number 7. And we're going to look all the way down in verse 46. Let me back up a little bit. All right, I'm going to start in verse 42, John 7, 42. Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. 
And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Jesus shows up on the scene. He begins his ministry, and right away, they began to see there's something different about this man. This man is not like any man that we've been around before. This man is not like any other man we've spoken to before. He's different. He doesn't talk the same. There's something different about this man. Never man spake like this man. And what's different about his words? What do they, Why are his words different? Uh, real quick, I'm, I'm just going to mention a few things here. Uh, his words are imperishable. Mark 13, 31. Let, let me read that real quick. Mark chapter 13 and verse 31. His words are not like any other man's words. They're different. They're in, imperishable. Mark 13, 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. His, his words were not just imperishable and, and, and eternal and lasting forever. His words were also gracious. He had gracious words. He talked with grace. In Luke 4 and verse 22, the Bible says, And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? They're like, Is this not the carpenter's son? He, his words are so gracious. There's something different about the way this man is talking. Uh, look down a few verses in verse 32 of Luke chapter 4. His words were not only gracious, they're they're mighty, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with powerful. Oh, was with power. His so his words are imperishable. They're gracious. They're mighty. John six sixty three. They're spiritual. John six sixty eight. They're life giving. Uh, John twelve forty eight. They're words of judgment. And John fourteen twenty four and First Timothy six three. We see his words are divine. This man is not like any other man. You know, they, they had have, they have the prophecies of the Messiah, and, and they're trying to figure out who this Jesus is, but they know one thing for sure. He's different. He's not like everyone else. He's different. He speaks different. So we see this man speaking. We also see this man sinless. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter number 23. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. This man is sinless. Pilate says, I find no fault in him. Now, we know Pilate's not the one that, that gives judgment on whether somebody is sinless or not. But first we see, you know, we looked at how the, during his ministry, the people around him saw this man's different, this man's speaking different, his words are different. People could, could tell there was something different about him. He wasn't just an ordinary human. He wasn't just an ordinary man. Yes, he was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. And he stood out because he spoke with authority. He spoke with wisdom. And when you get to this situation, when they're bringing false accusations, they're trying to find something they can get him on. Well, he did this and he did that. And he said this and he said that. And Pilate looks at him and says, I don't see anything wrong with him. I don't see where you can find pinpoint anything wrong with this man. I find no fault in him. And we know you keep reading you know, they be they get the mad and they get fierce and they they bother him about it and they want you know they want him to to crucify Jesus. And we know the story how Pilate washes his hands of the situation because he says, I, I think this man's innocent. I, I don't you know, it's actually in verse um let me read it to you real quick. Verse fourteen said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people, and behold I Having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof 
ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. But what do they want to do? They still wanted to kill him. They still wanted to crucify him. So the one that God promised, the one that God sent to restore the fellowship with man, mankind wants to kill him. Mankind wants to get rid of him. And they crucify him. He willingly died. But this man was sinless. And because he was sinless, that means that he could be the sacrifice for our sins. As we were talking about earlier, how we needed somebody that was sinless, but yet was a man that could take our sacrifice. That's why Jesus came. He was born of a virgin. He was you know, born in Bethlehem, grew up a sinless life, died for our sins. It was all to take away our sins. It was all to restore that fellowship between God and God. And man for the glory of God. Second Corinthians five twenty one. Second Corinthians five twenty one says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Praise the Lord for that. God took our sin, the nasty, disgusting filthy, vile sins that we and all other humans have committed. And he placed every bit of that on his holy, precious son. That's why Jesus was in agony in the garden. Not because he wanted to go through the, he didn't want to go through the physical pain, but because he didn't want to have to have that burden, the weight of the sin of the whole world. I mean, you think about the situation. Jesus is God. He's just as holy as God the Father. And the whole problem to begin with is that God is separate from sin. That's why we can't come to him because of our sin. And yet he willingly took that sin upon himself, placed it on his own account so that he could take it for us because of his love for us and obedience to his father. Praise the Lord for that sacrifice that he made. First Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously who his own self bear our sins on in his body, in his own body, on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Praise the Lord for that sacrifice he made. Praise the Lord for the shed blood of Christ when he took my sin upon himself and died on that cross for me. 1 John 3 and verse number 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. This man, this man is sinless. This man, there is no fault in this man. Next point, number three, and an amazing, amazing thing to think about here. This man receives sinners. This man receives sinners. I am very thankful that Jesus Christ receive sinners because I am a sinner. I, just like Job was talking about, the my righteousness being as filthy as it is, as vile as, as it is, my righteousness is as filthy rags. I, I'm, I'm a disgusting, filthy, rotten sinner. And yet Jesus receives me because of what he did on the cross. It's an amazing thought. Luke 15, 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spoke this parable unto them, saying, You know, real quick, I want to say, verses 1 and 2, The publicans and sinners draw near to Christ. God says, Draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. 
If you've never drawn near to Christ, even it doesn't matter what your sin of the past is. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you're doing. Where Repent of it and come to Christ. He will receive you. He loves you. He died for you. He's not willing for you to perish. Amen. And we see here, he receives and he eats with them. He dines with them. Because that's that's what his original, what he wanted to begin with. Back in the garden, he wanted to walk with man, talk with man, enjoy the fellowship and relationship with his creation. So we see when he comes as a man, one of the things he enjoys doing is, is eating with the people that he loves. And those people are sinners. Amen. Verse 4, what man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. You know, Christ doesn't just receive sinners, he seeks them. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This, this, this story here shows us Christ did all the work. That lamb that got lost, that sheep that was lost, it didn't have to do anything to be saved. It didn't have to do any kind of works. The Savior came, picked it up, carried it home. All it had to do was trust in the Savior, and we see the same thing in our salvation. We see saving just one soul causes Christ great joy. And you know, we have been given this ministry. The ministry is you know, Christ went after that lost sheep. Now he has given us that ministry of reconciliation for us to go out into the world, us to go out to the, the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in and go get that lost sheep. So we see he receives sinners. For time's sake, I've got some more stuff on this, but I'm just going to go on to the next point. We see this man is the sacrifice. This man is the sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. We've already talked about this a little bit. I want to talk about it some more because of this verse here. Hebrews 10, verse 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sacrificed. So what do we see here happening? For years, years and years and years, sacrifices were being made continually, but it never paid the price for sin. Year after year after year after year, they continue making these sacrifices, knowing that the next day they'd have to get up and make them again. But finally, there was one. Finally, there was a daysman, there was a mediator, there was a man that could come and pay the price for man's sin. One that was sinless, one that was without blemish, without spot. He did it willingly. And when he was finished, he sat down because he would never need to sacrifice again. We never have to go into a tabernacle or a temple and sacrifice a bull or sacrifice a goat or sacrifice any kind of animal, any kind of anything, because our sacrifice has been made. The precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was shed on the cross of Calvary for our sin, and it's sufficient. It's good enough. It satisfied the wrath, the wrath of God because it was the only sacrifice that could. It was the precious holy, sinless, without blemish blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Amen. He is that sacrifice for us. He paid that price, never has to do it again. Never has to make that sacrifice again because he already did it. Praise the Lord. 
Not only is he our sacrifice. Lastly, he is our high priest. This, he is our unchangeable great high priest. Go back to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter number 7. And let's look at verse 24. I'm trying to hurry up. About, about out of time here. Hebrews 7, 24. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. All the other priests died. He never will. His sacrifice is sufficient, unlike theirs. The contrast between him and the other priests. They had to keep making sacrifices. They were sinners. They were mortal. But now we can be reconciled to God because we have a high priest as making intercession for us, that made that sacrifice for us. We have a Savior. We have a sacrifice. We have a daysman, a Redeemer, one who is sinless and yet receives sinners. This man is Jesus Christ. First Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And this is why there's only one way to heaven. This is why Jesus Christ is the only way, because no other man is sinless. No other man paid that sacrifice. No other man is our great high priest. No, nobody else could bring us to God and God to us to put their hand on God, their hand on man, and bring the two together in reconciliation. Praise the Lord for that wonderful sacrifice. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I praise the Lord for his sacrifice. I praise the Lord that he became man so that he could take my sin. And he died on the cross for me. He died on the cross for you. And if you've never placed your faith in him, you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can today. Don't wait till it's too late. If you're listening to the sound of my voice right now on the radio, this may be your last chance to get saved. This may be your last warning before you die and spend eternity in a lake of fire. Jesus took your sin. You don't have to pay for it. Come to him. Believe on him. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's all the time I have left for today. I thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope it's been a blessing to you. I hope you, you maybe learned something, gleaned something from it. And tune in next time, and we'll have some more Bible teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Hearing by the Word of God broadcast. I'm TJ Bing. I hope you'll tune in next week and hear next week's message as we open the Word of God again and see what the Lord would have for us to learn. Thank you, and join in next time.